Part 5, Chapter 12 The Forty Days of Kenjir For the special camps, there was another side to Beria's fall. By raising their hopes, it confused, distracted, and disarmed the Katorzain. Hopes of speedy change burgeoned, their anger cooled. In that fateful year, 1953, the fall of Beria made it urgent for the security ministry to prove its devotion and its usefulness in some signal way. But how? The mutinies which the security men had hitherto considered a menace now shone like a beacon of salvation. Let's have more disturbances and disorders so that measures will have to be taken. Then staffs and salaries will not be reduced. In less than a year, the guards at Kenjir opened fire several times on innocent men, and it cannot have been unintentional. They shot Lida, the young girl from the mortar-mixing gang who hung her stockings out to dry near the boundary fence. They winged the old Chinaman. Nobody in Kenjir remembered his name, and he spoke hardly any Russian. But everybody knew the waddling figure with a pipe between his teeth and the face of an elderly goblin. A guard called him to a watchtower tossed a packet of makorka near the boundary fence, and one of the Chinaman reached for it, shot and wounded him. Then there was the famous case of the column returning to camp from the ore-dressing plant and being fired on with dum-dum bullets, which wounded sixteen men. This the Zaks did not take quietly. It was the Echibusta's story all over again. Kenjir Camp Division Number 3 did not turn out for work three days running, but did take food demanding punishment of the culprits. A commission arrived and persuaded them that the culprits would be prosecuted. They went back to work. But in February 1954, another prisoner was shot at the woodworking plant. The evangelist, as all Kenji remembered him, Alexander Sisoyev, I think his name was, this man had served nine years and nine months of his tenor. His job was fluxing arc-welding rods, and he did his work in a little shed which stood near the boundary fence. He went out to relieve himself near the shed, and while he was at it, was shot from a watchtower. Guards quickly ran over from the guardhouse and started dragging the dead man into the boundary zone to make it look as though he had trespassed on it. This was too much for the Zacks, who grabbed picks and shovels and drove the murderers away from the murdered man. The woodworking plant was in an uproar. The prisoners said that they would carry the dead man into camp on their shoulders. The camp officers would not permit it. Why did you kill him? shouted the prisoners. The bosses had their explanation ready. The dead man himself was to blame. He had started it by throwing stones at the tower. Can they have had time to read his identity card? Did they know that he had three months more to go and was an evangelical Christian? In the evening after supper, what they did was this. The light would suddenly go out in a section, and somebody invisible said from the doorway, Brothers, how long shall we go on building and taking our wages in bullets? Nobody goes to work tomorrow. The same thing happened in section after section, hut after hut. A note was thrown over the wall to the second camp division. In this division, which was multinational, the majority had tenors and many were coming to the end of their time, but they joined in just the same. In the morning, the men's camp divisions, two and three, did not report for work. This bad habit, striking without refusing the state's bread and slops, was becoming more and more popular with prisoners. They held out like this for two days, but the strike was mastered. For the second time in Kenjir, a ripening abscess was lanced before it could burst. But then the bosses went too far. They reached for the biggest stick they could use on the 58s. For the thieves. The bosses now renounced the whole principle of the special camps, acknowledged that if they segregated political prisoners, they had no means of making themselves understood, and brought into the mutinous number 3 camp division 650 men, most of them thieves, some of them petty offenders, including many miners, a healthy batch is joining us, the bosses spitefully warned the 58s. Now you won't dare breathe. The bosses understood well enough how the restorers of order would begin, by stealing, by preying on others, and so setting every man against his fellows. 
But here again we see how unpredictable is the course of human emotions and of social movements. Injecting in Kenjir No. 3 a mammoth dose of tested tomain, the bosses obtained not a pacified camp, but the biggest mutiny in the history of the Gulag Archipelago. Events followed their inevitable course. It was impossible for the politicals not to offer the thieves a choice between war and alliance. It was impossible for the thieves to refuse an alliance. And it was impossible for the alliance, once concluded, to remain inactive. The obvious first objective was to capture the service yard, in which all the camp's food stores were also situated. They began the operation in the afternoon of a non-working day, Sunday, May 16, 1954. All these quite undisguised operations took a certain time, during which the warders managed to get themselves organized and obtain instructions. The service yard was now firmly held by the punitive forces, and machine gunners were posted there. But the second camp division erected a barricade facing the service yard gate. The second and third camp divisions had been joined together by a hole in the wall, and there were no longer any warders, any MVD authority in them. How can we say what feelings wrung the hearts of those 8,000 men, who for so long and until yesterday had been slaves with no sense of fellowship, and now had united and freed themselves, not fully perhaps, but at least within the rectangle of those walls, and under the gaze of those quadrupled guards. So long suppressed, the Brotherhood of Man had broken through at last. Proclamations appeared in the mess hall. Arm yourselves as best as you can, and attack the soldiers first. The most passionate among them hastily scrawled their slogans on scraps of newspaper. Bash the Czechists, boys. Death to the Stoolies, the Czechas Stooges. Here, there, everywhere you turned, there were meetings and orators. Everybody had suggestions of his own. What demands shall we put forward? What is it we want? Put the murderers on trial, goes without saying. What else? No locking huts? Take the numbers off. But beyond that? Beyond that came the most frightening thing the real reason why they had started it all, what they really wanted. We want freedom, of course, just freedom, but who can give it to us? The judges who condemn us in Moscow. As long as our complaints are against Stepleg or Karaganda, they will go on talking to us. But if we start complaining against Moscow, we'll all be buried in this step. Well then, what do we want? To break holes in the walls? To run off in the wilderness? Those hours of freedom, immense chains had fallen from our arms and shoulders. No, whatever happened, there could be no regrets. That one day made it all worthwhile. Late on Monday, a delegation from the command HQ arrived in the seething camp. The delegation was quite well disposed. Our side learned that the generals had flown in from Moscow. They found the prisoners' demands fully justified. We simply gasped. Justified? We aren't rebels, then? No, no, they're quite justified. Those responsible for the shooting will be made to answer for it. But why did they beat up women? Beat up women? The delegation was shocked. That can't be true. Anya Mikhailovic brought in a succession of battered women for them to see. The commission was deeply moved. We'll look into it, never fear. Beasts! Layuba Vershatskaya shouts at the general. There were other shouts. No locks on the huts. We won't lock them any more. Take the numbers off. Certainly we'll take them off. The holes in the wall between the camp areas must remain. They were getting bolder. We must be allowed to mix with each other. All right, mix as much as you like. Let the holes remain. Right, brothers, what else do we want? We've won. We've won. We raised hell for just one day, enjoyed ourselves, let off steam and we won. Although some among us shake our heads and say, it's a trick, it's a trick, we believe it. We believe because that's our easiest way out of the situation. All that the downtrodden can do is go on hoping. After every disappointment, they must find fresh reason for hope. So on Tuesday, May 18, all Kenjir camp divisions went out to work, 
reconciling themselves to thoughts of their dead. That morning the whole affair could still have ended quietly, but the exalted generals assembled in Kenjir would have considered such an outcome a defeat for themselves. They could not seriously admit that prisoners were in the right. When the columns of prisoners returned to camp in the evening after giving a day's work to the state, they were hurried in to supper before they knew what was happening, so that they could be locked up quickly. On orders from the general, the jailers had to play for a time that first evening, that evening of blatant dishonesty after yesterday's promises. But before nightfall, the long-drawn whistles heard on Sunday shrilled through the camp again. The second and third camp divisions were calling to each other like hooligans on a spree. The warders took fright and fled from the campgrounds without finishing their duties. The camp was in the hands of the Zex, but they were divided. The towers opened fire with machine guns on anyone who approached the inside walls. They killed several and wounded several. Once again, Zex broke all the lamps with slingshots, but the towers lit up the camp with flares. They battered at the barbed wire and the new fence posts with long tables, but it was impossible under fire either to break through the barrier or to climb over it, so they had to burrow under. As always, there were no shovels, except those for use in case of fire inside the camp. Kitchen knives and mess tins were put into service. That night, May 18th to 19th, they burrowed under all the walls and again united all the divisions and the service yard. The towers had stopped shooting now, and there were plenty of tools in the service yard. Under cover of night, they broke down the boundary fences, knocked holes in the walls, and widened the passages so that they would not become traps. That night, they broke through the wall around the 4th Camp Division, the prison area too. The warders guarding the jails fled. The prisoners wrecked the interrogation offices. Among those from the jail were those who on the morrow would take command of the Rising. Former Red Army Colonel Kapitan Kuznetsov and former First Lieutenant Glebs Lukenkov. Mutinous Zex, these 8,000 men had not so much raised a rebellion as escaped to freedom, though not for long. 8,000 men, from being slaves, had suddenly become free, and now was their chance to live. Faces, usually grim, softened into kind smiles. Women looked at men, and men took them by the hand some who had corresponded by ingenious secret ways without even seeing each other, met at last. Lithuanian girls whose weddings had been solemnized by priests on the other side of the wall now saw their lawful wedded husbands for the first time. The Lord had sent down to earth the marriages made into heaven. For the first time in their lives, no one tried to prevent the sectarians and believers from meeting for prayer, Foreigners scattered about the camp divisions now found each other and talked about this strange Asiatic revolution in their own languages. The camp's food supply was in the hands of the prisoners. No one drove them out to work line-up and an eleven-hour working day. The morning of May 19 dawned over a feverishly sleepless camp which had torn off its number patches. Many took their street clothes from the storerooms and put them on. Some of the lads crammed fur hats on their heads. Shortly, there would be embroidered shirts, and on the Central Asians, bright-colored robes and turbans. The gray-black camp would be a blaze of color. Orderlies went around the huts, summoning us to the big mess hall to elect a commission for negotiations with the authorities and for self-government. For all they knew, they were electing it just for a few hours but it was destined to become the government of Kenjir camp for forty days. The days ran on, and the generals were regretfully forced to conclude that the camp was not disintegrating of its own accord, and that there was no excuse to send troops in to the rescue. The camp stood fast, and the negotiations changed their character. Golden epauletted personages in various combinations continued coming into the camp to argue and persuade. They were all allowed in, but they had to pick up white flags and they had to undergo a body search. In return, the rebel staff guaranteed their personal safety. They showed the generals around wherever it was allowed, not, of course, around the secret sector of the service yard. 
let them talk to prisoners, and called big meetings in the camp divisions for their benefit. Their epaulets flashing, the bosses took their seats in the presidium as of old, as though nothing were amiss. The discussions sometimes took the form of direct negotiations on the loftiest diplomatic model. Sometime in June, a long mess table was placed in the women's camp, and the golden epaulets seated themselves on a bench to one side of it, while the tommy gunners allowed in with them as a bodyguard stood at their backs. Across the table, the members of the commission, and they too had a bodyguard, which stood there looking very serious, armed with sabers, pikes, and slingshots. In the background, crowds of prisoners gathered to listen to the pow-wow and shout comments. Refreshments for the guests were not forgotten. The rebels had agreed on their demands, or requests, in the first two days, and now repeated them over and over again. Punish the evangelist's murderer. Punish all those responsible for the murders on Sunday night in the service yard. Punish those who beat up the women. Bring back those comrades who had been illegally sent to closed prisons for striking. No more number patches, window bars, or locks on hut doors. Inner walls between camp divisions not to be rebuilt. An eight-hour day as for free workers. An increase in payment for work. Here there was no question of equality with free workers. Unrestricted correspondence with relatives, periodic visits. Although there was nothing unconstitutional in any of these demands, nothing that threatened the foundations of the state, indeed many of them were requests for a return to the old position, it was impossible for the bosses to accept even the least of them, because these bald skulls under service caps and supported by clothes-clipped fat necks had forgotten how to admit a mistake or a fault. Truth was unrecognizable and repulsive to them if it manifested itself not in secret instructions from higher authority, but on the lips of common people. Still, the obduracy of the eight thousand under siege was a blot on the reputation of the generals. It might ruin their careers, and so they made promises. They promised that nearly all the demands would be satisfied. They could hardly leave the women's camp open. That was against the rules, forgetting that in the corrective labor camps it had been that way for twenty years. But they could consider arranging, should they say, meeting days. To the demand that the commission of inquiry should start its work inside the camp, the generals unexpectedly agreed. But Shlukenkov guessed their purpose and refused to hear of it. While making their statements, the stoolies would expose everything that was happening in the camp. Review of cases? Well, of course, cases would be re-examined, but prisoners would have to be patient. There was one thing that couldn't wait at all. The prisoners must get back to work, to work, to work. But the Zex knew that trick by now. Dividing them up into columns, forcing them to ground at gunpoint, arresting the ringleaders. No, they answered across the table and from the platform. No, shouted voices from the crowd. The administration of Stepleg have behaved like provocateurs. We do not trust the Stepleg authorities. We don't trust the MVD. Don't trust even the MVD? The vice minister was thrown into a sweat by this treasonable talk. And who can have inspired you in such hatred for the MVD? A riddle, if there ever was one. There were weeks when the whole war became a war of propaganda. The outside radio was never silent. Through several loudspeakers set up at intervals around the camp, it interlarded appeals to the prisoners with information and misinformation, and with a couple of trite and boring records that frayed everybody's nerves. Through the meadow goes a maiden, she whose braided hair I love. Still to be thought worthy, even of that not very high honor. Having records played to them, they had to rebel. Even rubbish like that wasn't played for men on their knees. These records also served, in the spirit of the times, as a jamming device, drowning the broadcasts from the camps intended for the escort troops. On the outside radio, they sometimes tried to blacken the whole movement, asserting that it had been started with the sole aim of rape and plunder. 
At other times, they tried telling filthy stories about members of the commission. Then the appeals would begin again. Work, work. Why should the motherland keep you for nothing? By not going to work, you were doing enormous damage to the state. This was supposed to pierce the hearts of men doomed to eternal katorga. Whole trainloads of coal are standing in the siding. There's nobody to unload it. Let them stand there, the Zex laughed. You'll give way all the sooner. The technical department, however, gave as good as it got. Two portable film projectors were found in the service yard. Their amplifiers were used for loudspeakers, less powerful, of course, than those of the other side. The fact that the camp had electricity and radio greatly surprised and troubled the bosses. They were afraid that the rebels might rig up a transmitter and start broadcasting news about their rising to foreign countries. The camp soon had its own announcers. Programs included the latest news and news features. There was also a daily wall newspaper with cartoons. Crocodile Tears was the name of a program ridiculing the anxiety of the MVD men about the fate of women whom they themselves had previously beaten up. But there was not enough power to put on programs for the only potential sympathizers to be found in Kenjir, the free inhabitants of the settlement, many of them exiles. It was they whom the settlement authorities were trying to fool, not by radio, but with rumors that bloodthirsty gangsters and insatiable prostitutes were ruling the roost inside the camp. That over there innocent people were being tortured and burned alive in furnaces. How could the prisoners call out through the walls to the workers one or two or three kilometers away? Brothers, we only want justice. We only want justice. They were murdering us for no crime of ours. They were treating us worse than dogs. Here are our demands. The thoughts of the technical department, since they had no chance to outstrip modern science, moved backward instead of to the science of past ages. Using cigarette paper, they pasted together an enormous air balloon. A bundle of leaflets was attached to the balloon, and slung underneath it was a brazier containing glowing coals which sent a current of warm air into the dome of the balloon through an opening in its base. To the huge delight of the assembled crowd, if prisoners ever do feel happy, they are like children. The marvelous aeronautical structure rose and was airborne, but alas, the speed of the wind was greater than the speed of its ascent, and as it was flying over the boundary fence, the brazier caught on barbed wire. The balloon denied its current of warm air, fell and burned to ashes, together with the leaflets. After this failure, they started inflating balloons with smoke. With a following wind, they flew quite well, exhibiting inscriptions in large letters to the settlement. Save the women and old men from being beaten. We demand to see a member of the Presidium. The guards started shooting at these balloons. Then some check-in prisoners came to the technical department and offered to make kites. They are experts. They succeeded in sticking some kites together and paying out the string until they were over the settlement. There was a percussive device on the frame of each kite. When the kite was in a convenient position, the device scattered a bundle of leaflets, also attached to the kite. The kite flyer sat on the roof of a hut, waiting to see what would happen next. If the leaflets fell close to the camp, warders ran to collect them. If they fell farther away... Motorcyclists and horsemen dashed after them. Whatever happened, they tried to prevent the free citizens from reading an independent version of the truth. The leaflets ended by requesting any citizen of Kenjir who found one to deliver it to the Central Committee. The kites were also shot at, but holing was less damaging to them than to the balloons. The enemy soon discovered that sending up counter-kites to tangle strings with them was cheaper than keeping a crowd of warders on the run. A war of kites in the second half of the twentieth century, and all to silence a word of truth. In the meantime, the technical department was getting its notorious secret weapon ready. Let me describe it. Aluminum corner brackets for cattle troughs, produced in the workshops and awaiting dispatch, were packed with a mixture of sulfur scraped from matches and a little calcium carbide. When the sulfur was lit and the brackets thrown, they hissed and burned into little pieces. 
but neither these star-crossed geniuses nor the field staff in the bathhouse were to choose the hour, place, and form of the decisive battle. Some two weeks after the beginning of the revolt, on one of those dark nights, without a glimmer of light anywhere, thuds were heard at several places around the camp wall. This time it was not escaping prisoners or rebels battering it down. The wall was being demolished by the convoy troops themselves. In the morning it turned out that the enemy without had made about a dozen breaches in the wall, in addition to those already there and the barricaded gateway. Machine gun posts had been set up on the other side of the gaps to prevent the Zeks from pouring through them. This was, of course, the preliminary for an assault through the breaches, and the camp was a seething anthill as it prepared to defend itself. The rebel staff decided to pull down the inner walls and the mud-brick outhouses, and to erect a second circular wall of their own, specially reinforced with stacks of brick where it faced the gaps, to give protection against machine-gun bullets. How things have changed. The troops were demolishing the boundary wall, the prisoners were rebuilding it, and the thieves were helping with a clear conscience, not feeling that they were contravening their code. Additional defense posts now had to be established opposite the gaps, and every platoon assigned to a gap, which it must run to defend should the alarm be raised at night. The Zacks quite seriously prepared to advance against machine guns with pikes. There was one attack in the daytime. Tommy gunners were moved up to one of the gaps opposite the balcony of the Stepleg Administration Building, which was packed with important personages holding cameras or even movie cameras. The soldiers were in no hurry. They merely advanced just far enough into the breach for the alarm to be given, whereupon the rebel platoons responsible for the defense of the breach rushed out to man their barricade, brandishing their pikes and holding stones and mud bricks, and then, from the balcony, movie cameras whirred and pocket cameras clicked, taking care to keep the tommy gunners out of the picture. Disciplinary officers, prosecutors, party officials, and all the rest of them, party members to a man, of course, laughed at the bizarre spectacle of the impassioned savages with pikes. Well fed and shameless, these grand personages mocked their starved and cheated fellow citizens from the balcony, and found it all very funny. Then warders, too, stole up to the gaps and tried to slip nooses with hooks over the prisoners, as though they were hunting wild animals or the abominable snowman, hoping to drag out a talker. But what they mainly counted on now were deserters, rebels with cold feet. The radio blared away. Come to your senses. Those who come over will not be tried for mutiny. The commission's response over the camp radio was this. Anybody who wants to run away can go right ahead. Through the main gate if he likes. We are holding no one back. In all those weeks, only about a dozen men fled from the camp. Why? Surely the rest did not believe in victory. Were they not appalled by the thought of the punishment ahead? They were. Did they not want to save themselves for their family's sake? They did. They were torn and thousands of them perhaps had secretly considered this possibility. But the social temperature on this plot of land had risen so high that if souls were not transmuted, they were purged of dross, and the sordid laws saying that, we only live once, that being determines consciousness, and that every man's a coward when his neck is at stake, ceased to apply for that short time in that circumscribed place. The laws of survival and of reason told people that they must all surrender together or flee individually. But they did not surrender, and they did not flee. They rose to that spiritual plane from which executioners are told, The devil take you for his own, torture us, savage us. And the operation, so beautifully planned, to make prisoners scatter like rats through the gaps in the wall till only the most stubborn were left, who would then be crushed, this operation collapsed because its inventors had the mentality of rats themselves. No one supported the island of Kenjir. It was impossible by now to take off into the wilderness. The garrison was being steadily reinforced. The whole camp had been encircled with a double barbed wire fence outside the walls. 
there was only one rosy spot on the horizon. The Lord and Master, they were expecting Malenkov, was coming to dispense justice, but it was too tiny a spot and too rosy. They could not hope for pardon. All they could do was live out their last days of freedom and submit to Steplag's vengeance. There are always hearts which cannot stand the strain. Some were already morally crushed and were in an agony of suspense for the crushing proper to begin. Some quietly calculated that they were not really involved and need not if they went on being careful. Some were newly married. What is more, with a proper religious ceremony, a Western Ukrainian girl, for instance, will not marry without one. And thanks to Gulag's thoughtfulness, there were priests of all religions there. For these newlyweds, the bitter and sweet succeeded each other with a rapidity which ordinary people never experience in their slow lives. They observed each day as their last, and retribution delayed was a gift from heaven each morning. The believers, prayed, and leaving the outcome of the Kenji revolt in God's hands, were always the calmest of people. Services for all religions were held in the mess hall according to a fixed timetable. The Jehovah's Witnesses felt free to observe their rules strictly and refused to build fortifications or stand guard. They sat for hours on end with their heads together, saying nothing. They were made to wash the dishes. A prophet, genuine or sham, went around the camp putting crosses on bunks and foretelling the end of the world. Some knew that they were fatally compromised and that the few days before the troops arrived were all that was left of life. The theme of all their thoughts and actions must be how to hold out longer. These people were not the unhappiest. The unhappiest were those that were not involved and who prayed for the end. But when all these people gathered at meetings to decide whether to surrender or to hold on, they found themselves again in that heated climate where their personal opinions dissolved and ceased to exist even for themselves, or else they feared ridicule even more than the death that awaited them. And when they voted for or against holding out, the majority were for. Why did it drag on so long? What can the bosses have been waiting for? For the food to run out? They knew it would last a long time. Were they considering opinion in the settlement? They had no need to. Were they carefully working out their plan of repression? They could have been quicker about it. Were they having to seek approval for the operation up top? How high up? There is no knowing on what date and at what level the decision was taken. On several occasions, the main gate of the service yard suddenly opened, perhaps to test the readiness of the defenders. The duty picket sounded the alarm, and the platoons poured out to meet the enemy, but no one entered the campgrounds. In the middle of June, several tractors appeared in the settlement. They were working, shifting something perhaps, around the boundary fence. They began working even at night. The unfriendly roar made the night seem blacker. And suddenly the skeptics were put to shame, and the defeatists, and all those who said that there would be no mercy, and that there was no point in begging. The Orthodox alone could feel triumphant. On June 22nd, the outside radio announced that the prisoners' demands had been accepted. A member of the Presidium of the Central Committee was on his way. The rosy spot turned into a rosy sun, a rosy sky. Is it, then, possible to get through to them? There is, then, justice in our country. They will give a little, and we will give a little. If it comes to it, we can walk about with number patches, and the bars on the windows needn't bother us. We aren't thinking of climbing out. You say they're tricking us again? Well, well, they aren't asking us to report for work beforehand. Just as the touch of a stick will draw off the charge from an electroscope so that the agitated gold leaf sinks gratefully to rest, so did the radio announcement reduce the brooding tension of that last week. Even the loathsome tractors, after working for a while on the evening of June 24th, stopped their noise. Prisoners could sleep peacefully on the fortieth night of the revolt. He would probably arrive tomorrow. Perhaps he had come already. In the early dawn of Friday, June 25th, parachutes carrying flares opened out into the sky. More flares soared from the watchtowers, 
and the observers on the rooftops were picked off by snipers' bullets before they could let out a squeak. Then cannon fire was heard. Airplanes skimmed the camp, spreading panic. Tanks, the famous T-34s, had taken up position under cover of the tractor noise and now moved on the gaps from all sides. One of them, however, fell into a ditch. Some of the tanks dragged concatenations of barbed wire on the trestles so that they could divide up the campgrounds immediately. Behind others ran helmeted assault troops with Tommy guns. Both Tommy gunners and tank crews had been given vodka first. However special the troops may be, it is easier to destroy unarmed and sleeping people with drink inside you. Operators with walkie-talkies came in with the advancing troops. The generals went up into the towers with the snipers, and from there, in the daylight, in the daylight shed by the flares, and a light from a tower set on fire by the Zeks with their incendiary bombs, gave their orders, Take hut number so-and-so. The camp woke up, frightened out of its wits. Some stayed where they were in their huts, lying on the floor as their one chance of survival, and because the resistance seemed senseless. Others tried to make them get up and join in the resistance, yet others ran into the line of fire, either to fight or to seek a quicker death. The third camp division fought, the division which had started it all. They hurled stones at the Tommy gunners and warders, and probably sulfur bombs at the tanks. Nobody thought of the powdered glass. One hut counterattacked twice, with shouts of hurrah. The tanks crushed everyone in their way. Alla Pressman from Kiev was run over. The tracks passed over her abdomen. Tanks rode up onto the porches of huts and crushed people there. The tanks grazed the sides of huts and crushed those who were clinging to them to escape the caterpillar tracks. Semyon Rak and his girl threw themselves under a tank clasped in each other's arms and ended it that way. Tanks nosed into the thin board walls of the huts and even fired blank shells into them. Fina Epstein remembers the corner of a hut collapsing, as if in a nightmare, and a tank passing obliquely over the wreckage and other living bodies. Women tried to jump and fling themselves out of the way. Behind the tank came a lorry, and the half-naked women were tossed out into it. The cannon shots were blank, but the Tommy guns were shooting live rounds, and the bayonets were cold steel. Women tried to shield men with their own bodies, and they, too, were bayoneted. Security officer Believ shot two dozen people with his own hand that morning. When the battle was over, he was seen putting knives into the hands of corpses for their photographer to take pictures of dead gangsters. Supran, a member of the commission and a grandmother, died from a wound in her lung. Some prisoners hid in the latrines and were riddled with bullets there. As a group of prisoners were taken... They were marched through the gaps onto every step between the files of Kenjir convoy troops outside. They were searched and made to lie flat on their faces and their arms stretched straight out. As they lay there thus crucified, MVD flyers and warders walked among them to identify and pull out those whom they had spotted earlier from the air or from the watchtowers. So busy were they with all this that no one had leisure to open Pravda that day. It had a special theme, a day in the life of our motherland, the successes of steelworkers. More and more crops harvested by machine. The historian surveying our country as it was that day will have an easy task. The victorious generals descended from the towers and went off to breakfast. Without knowing any of them, I feel confident that their appetite that June morning left nothing to be desired and that they drank deeply. An alcoholic hum would not in the least disturb the ideological harmony in their heads, and what they had for hearts was something installed with a screwdriver. The number of those killed or wounded was about 600, according to the stories, but according to figures given by the Kenjir Division's production planning section, which became known some months later, it was more than 700. All day on June 25th, the prisoners lay down on the step in the sun. For days on end, the heat had been unmerciful. While in the camp, there was endless searching and breaking open and shaking out. The members of the commission and other suspects were locked up in the camp jail. More than a thousand people were selected for dispatch either to closed prisons or to Kalima. 
As always, these lists were drawn up partly by guesswork, so that many who had not been involved at all found their way into them. May this picture of the pacification bring peace to the souls of those whom the last chapters have graded. On June 26, the prisoners were made to spend the whole day taking down the barricades and bricking in the gaps. On June 27, they were marched out to work. Those trains in the sidings would wait no longer for working hands. The tanks which had crushed Kenjir traveled under their own power to Rudnik and crawled around for the Zex to see and draw their conclusions. End of Part 5